So gills, we're used to gills looking like they do in fish. You know, with fish, they just look like slits in the side of their body. And then underneath those slits, there's the gills. But gills don't always have to look like that. They just have to be some sort of surface which can take out oxygen from the water and take it into the animal's body. And that is what these do. So basically, they're this a slightly strange shape to have a big surface area to kind of take up any oxygen they can find because there's not very much oxygen where these Pompeii worms live. So we call them extremophiles, which is a name we give to animals that basically, or any living thing, that lives in super extreme environments. So not only do these worms live down in the ocean, the deep, deep ocean, which is hard to live wherever you're living down there, but they actually are found only at these things called hydrothermal vents. And these are basically like um, cracks that form at the bottom of like the seabed. And it's like a bit of a tectonic plate or land is kind of cracked or split open. And then like molten lava like stuff called magma from underground the same stuff that comes out of volcanoes has kind of oozed up from underneath and sort of come out of that crack and it causes these like boiling hot springs so that thing that you can see in the background that like smoke like stuff billowing that is a called a black smoker where basically all of this boiling hot water is like spewing out of this crack in the seabed doesn't seem like there could be any life there but amazingly there is and the pompeii worm only lives in these things where there's boiling hot water and in fact these little worms can cope with temperatures up to 105 degrees celsius so they're just plopped into a boiling hot um pot of water basically so the question is how on earth do they do this like how can they possibly be in such high temperatures and survive okay so that brings us to our first quiz now this is quite a tricky one, actually. I've, I've been quite tricky on this one. So don't worry if you don't know the answer. Just take a guess. You don't even have to vote if you don't want to. But the, the votes are anonymous. I can't even see who voted for what. I can just see numbers. So feel free to have a vote. Don't worry if you don't know the answer. And remember, even though every lesson we do do a different topic, for people who have been coming to my lessons for a long, long time, um, they might get like more used to these quizzes or they might remember certain things from other lessons. So you can also get better at them, uh, at them as time goes on. OK, so what helps make the Pompeii worm heat resistant? How do they possibly survive in 105 degrees Celsius? Somebody said I can see how they got their name. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? It's their ability to live in these black smokers and where there's this magma, which is the same stuff you get from volcanoes and volcanic eruptions. Okay, five seconds, then we'll talk about the answer. So the answer was B. So this is really strange because that why would a coating of bacteria help you survive 105 degrees Celsius? Well, scientists are still figuring this out, but there's a few things we do know. So basically, when you see all this kind of furry grey stuff on the body of the Pompeii worm, a lot of that is actually bacteria. So their body is covered in slime, 
and then there's thick layers of bacteria that just live on their body all the time so there's like a layer of them not just like a normal amount of bacteria that you'd find on any surface and the this type of bacteria is special because they're particularly good at surviving in these hot conditions because the bacteria are also living and they're surviving down there as well. And this layer of bacteria actually kind of insulates the worm's body. And when we think of something insulating us, we normally think of like keeping us warm. But remember, it can also keep hot temperatures out as well, kind of locking everything down. So, so yeah, they've basically got this slime that gets uh, made by these glands in the worm's body. That slime is like a mucus that bacteria feed on. That's why bacteria colonize the body of the worm in these thick layers that basically insulate them and stop them getting burnt by these super hot springs underwater. So they've basically got this like what we call a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria on their backs. Symbiotic relationship just means two different living things, both getting something helpful out of their interaction, right? So it could be something as simple as like um, when you see those birds that sit on the backs of like antelopes and eat ticks and stuff off them. The bird is getting a meal and then the um, antelope likes it because it's getting rid of these pesty parasites it's kind of like that so the symbiotic bacteria gets somewhere to live and it eats the mucus the slime on the body of the worm that the worm makes um and then the worm is getting protection from the heat because they grow so densely that they form a layer that's about a centimeter thick and they insulate the worms and protect them from the hot water pretty cool right uh someone has asked what's the other term for the midnight zone so if we come back to our diagram here it's that bathypelagic bathypelagic so from 700 meters down to 1000 meters down that's the um midnight zone or the bathypelagic we often nickname the midnight zone, um, twilight zone, etc., because it's a bit catchier than the technical terms. Someone has asked how cold resistant are they? That's a good question. I mean, I would think that they, I don't actually know what temperature range they can like cope with. But I would think that they could also withstand super cold temperatures because, again, because it's this layer insulate, insulates them, it will help them regulate their temperature, whether it's too hot or too cold. And also, even though they do spend their lives at these hot springs, obviously the rest of the deep ocean is pretty cold. So I would imagine they'd be good at coping with cold temperatures too, although they never really will have to um, because they're always at these hot springs because that's where that bacteria is um, and that's what they feed off as well. So let's move on and let's talk about a jellyfish. So this is called a phantom jelly or sometimes giant phantom jelly. And these are really cool jellyfish, first of all, because they're pretty mysterious. Um, They've only been spotted about 130 times ever, which I know that might seem like a lot. But I mean, if you compare that to common jellyfish that people will see thousands and thousands of times a year, these have only ever been recorded and sighted by scientists um, about 130 times. And in fact, when they were first spotted, um, when a scientist first saw one and observed it in the ocean, people didn't even figure out it was a brand new species to science for 60 years. Um, and they're only found in the deeper parts of the ocean. So they can be found 
at depths of around 6,000 meters or so, which is like 21,000 feet down. So they'll be found in the twilight zone, which is again, if we look back at this, so that's that mesopelagic is the twilight zone. Bathypelagic is the midnight zone. So those two zones are where you often find these jellyfish. But a lot of the time they hang out in that midnight zone, the bathypelagic one. Now, giant phantom jelly, they get the giant part of their name because they've got hugely long arms. So one of the interesting things about this um, jellyfish is that they don't have tentacles. They only have arms. So if that sounds confusing, okay, if you see some pictures of most jellyfish, you might notice that they've got these really skinny, like stringy bits. Those are the tentacles, the really thin long bits. Those are tentacles. Those are the things that uh, jellyfish sting with if they can sting. The bits like what this jellyfish has, they're the only sort of um, things they have dangling down. Those are arms. So they're like a lot thicker. They almost look like, what do they look like? Like streamers or ribbons. So some jellyfish just have tentacles. Some jellyfish have tentacles and arms. And some just have arms. This is a rare one, which just has arms, which means they cannot sting because they don't have tentacles with stingers on. Somebody says it looks creepy and kind of AI generated. It, it does a bit, doesn't it? I promise this is not AI generated. This is a real picture of them. But I, I, they do look kind of like mystical, don't they? I think one of the thing that, things that makes them look uh, quite strange as well in these pictures is in a lot of these pictures of the deep sea creatures, you see what looks a bit like glitter, you know, those little white speckly bits. You might often see these on pictures of deep sea animals. Um, does anyone know what that is? That speckly white stuff. Yes, it's called, so a nickname for it is marine snow. It's not snow, of course. It's basically dead bits of stuff floating around. This could be anything from like tiny bits of dead animals, like tiny bits of plankton. It could be the poo from marine animals could be anything. <laughs> Someone said, I thought it was dust on my screen. It does look a bit like dust, doesn't it? So it looks quite pretty, but it's actually a little bit gross, but it's very important, very, very important because basically in these deep sea parts of the ocean, that is what a lot of animals eat because it's like this just like leftover stuff from the higher layers where there's loads more animals and loads more plants growing and it just kind of floats down and eventually it gets deep down into the deep parts of the ocean and a lot of things eat it because it's it's carrying like um nutrients it's a bit like a fertilizer for the ocean oh someone says they've heard of meat rain i've never heard of what so was that is that another name for marine snow marine snow sounds a little bit more um mystical doesn't it meat rain is quite it's quite um disturbing i think <laughs> that's funny though i've never heard of that oh it's damien who told you that that's really cool i've not heard of it being called that i like that that's a pretty uh it's gross but it's cool it's a good description it kind of tells you more what it is, to be honest. Um, I have a good question here about the Pompeii worms. 
So remember, anytime you like, you're very welcome to like ask a question in the chat. I always try to come back to them and answer as many as I can. Sometimes I can't get time for them all. Or sometimes I don't know the answer, um, but then I'll normally tell you that. Um, so I can see here, uh, someone has said, how do the Pompeii worms spread to other hydrothermal vents? Um, so it will be when they um, spawn, when they have um, eggs. So a lot of um, sea creatures, well, there's different types of breeding behavior in sea creatures, but um, a lot of them, especially small things like worms, they'll do like spawning, um, which is like how they breed and how they um, lay eggs. And when they're doing that, that's when they can carry through the water and then settle at a new hydrothermal vent and like spread to new ones. Okay, so... Phantom jellyfish, this cool jellyfish that we're learning about here, a part of something called a monotypic genus, okay? What do you think, and you can take a complete guess, don't worry if you have no idea, take a complete guess, that's fine. What do you think monotypic genus might mean? Is it A, a group of animals more closely related than a family, but less similar than a species? Is it B, a group of animals with a misleading common name. C, the particular species from which the genus is named. Or D, a genus with only one species in it. So before I put the quiz on the screen, also, um, just for anyone who hasn't heard of a genus before, a genus is like a group that we'd kind of put different animals in that are closely related. So as an example, um, a tiger and um, like a, a lion, for example, will group them into things like, oh, well, they're both cats, they're both mammals. So we'll put them into smaller and smaller groups. Um, when, the, when two animals are in the same genus, it means they're super similar but they're not exactly the same animal. So they're not the same species. So sometimes when you see a scientific name, which is like, so for example, with the giant phantom jelly, the phantom jelly is its common name. That's what we call it in English. In the brackets, you can see two words. They're always in slanted writing in italics. That's the scientific name. So most animals have a common name and a scientific name. Scientific names are handy because that it doesn't matter like where you live in the world, what language you speak, the scientific name will be the same. So scientists from all over the world can be talking to each other and writing papers together about the same species and they can use the scientific name. Because it can get very confusing when we all have different common names for different animals in different languages and stuff like that. So like when you see that, the first words is the genus of this jellyfish. And then the second word is its species. That's how we do those. Okay. So back to our quiz, let's launch it and feel free to have a vote. Okay, so what does monotypic genus mean? Does it mean group of animals more closely related than the family, but less similar than the species? B, a group of animals with a misleading common name, C, the particular species from which the genus is named, or D, a genus with only one species in it. What do you think? Um, someone has asked, do phantom jellyfish have stomachs? Um, yes. So um, it's one of the few things that jellyfish do have is a stomach. Because like they don't have a heart, they don't really have a brain. They do have some nerves, but they don't have a proper brain. They don't have a heart. They're mostly just water, which is what gives them the jelly-like texture. 
Um, but they do have a mouth, which you could, normally can't see. Um, but it's um, the mouth is like if you were to look kind of in the middle of the tentacles or arms. So it'd be kind of like underneath the jellyfish. In the middle is where like their mouth is. Um, and then inside that, what we call the bell, um, which is like the bell-shaped part of the jellyfish, um, the stomach would be inside that. Someone's asked a good question. Why are scientific names always written in italics? So italics is that slanted writing. So uh, there's a couple of reasons. So reason one is because that um, it's for a historical reason, because that normally scientific names come from like they're derived from like Greek or Latin words. But also it's very handy because like if you're skimming a scientific research paper and um, you can eat more easily like spot the scientific names when they're in italics as well so it makes it easier for in a few ways as well okay so the answer is it's a genus with only one species in it so basically right what that means is this type of jellyfish doesn't really have any super close relatives Obviously, all the other jellyfish that exist are its relatives, but it doesn't have any that are in this same genus, the Stygiomedusa. So it's kind of, of a lot of the jellyfish, it's one that's very unique. Um, and there's a lot that we still don't know about it because it hasn't been seen very often. Um, and often, it, the only time that we've taken got photos taken of it, like this one, is from these remote operated uh, vehicles which get sent down into deep parts of the ocean because that's safer and, than, and easier than taking humans down there because we cannot really cope with the conditions down in these deep parts of the ocean. So ROV, so this here, stands for remotely operated uh, vehicle. And they're these like underwater machines that scientists use to send down into deep parts of the ocean and um, take photos and film stuff and find out stuff for us. Um, so often these will be controlled by like a person um, on, say, a boat or something um, on top of the water. And they'll use like almost like a joystick, like you would play a video game. And then a load of cables will kind of connect the machine to the ship or the boat and send signals electrical signals back and forth between the person operating it with the little stick and the vehicle so they'll often have like a camera video camera lights so they can take photos and video footage of these super cool animals so these giant phantom jellyfish um, have a one meter bell. So the bell is the bell shaped part. And these guys have a really bell shaped um, bell as well. It's like really got that exaggerated shape. So that part of the jellyfish is like where the stomach and the mouth are inside there. And um, so that's called the bell. And then the arms, and they've got four arms, can sometimes be as long as 10 meters or 33 foot long each. And they use those arms to kind of tangle up and trap prey and then bring them up to their mouth, which is like in the center of the arms um, because they don't have stingers. So they're just kind of grabbing onto prey and trapping it instead of stinging them. Very, very cool. But there's a lot we don't know about them. Like we don't really know much about how they breed. We can kind of guess based off what other jellyfish do, but we've never really seen them um, doing that sort of behavior. And like their lifespan and stuff, again, like there's a lot we don't know because we just haven't been able to study them enough. Okay, so next up, we are gonna talk about squid and octopus, okay? Now squids and octopus and also cuttlefish and nautilus, are in a group of animals that we call cephalopods. The zoologists, people who study animals, call them cephalopods. Um, 
And you can probably see that that makes sense because when you look at squids and octopus, they have a lot of things in common. So we put them in like the same related groups. We call them cephalopods and that includes all of the squid, all of the octopuses and all of the cuttlefish and nautilus. So what do you think is the name of 